For those of you who don't know, I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a veterinary dentist, and I'm also a diplomat in the American Academy of Pain Management. I currently practice in Orlando and Atlanta and Punta Gorda, Florida. Right now I'm in Orlando. We had a busy day today, and I actually just got off and back to the hotel in time to do this not long ago. So uh, we'll get started. This is, uh, this is the first example of something that we see quite commonly, actually, in veterinary dentistry, where we have really no gross pathology, and everything looks fairly normal without our radiographic assessment. But once we start to look at our radiographs, we find things quite different. This is the radiograph of that exact area. And if you look here, this is the area that we're looking at. And this fourth premolar here has undergone a tremendous amount of bone destruction. As you can see, there is a lucency here surrounding the distal root or the caudal root of this fourth premolar on the right mandible on this dog. And this lucency, in fact, is not just a void. There is a, a significant amount of tissue in any void that you see radiographically. This is an example of what you will find in those voids. This is the same tooth. And what we're looking at here is just a lot of nasty granulation tissue that's present in this defect. Here you can see the bone level. As we saw it here, but down deep into this bone surrounding this root, down below this level is also a tremendous defect. And once we clean this thing out, we can actually see the extent of that. So it looks much, much more involved. Many times after we've opened the tissue up to take a look inside to see what's going on, and the radiographic correlation and the gross exposure correlation usually sides on the gross exposure being worse than the radiographic signs. One of the reasons for that is you actually have to have about 40% of the inorganic components of the bone destroyed, in other words, the calcium and phosphate destroyed, in order to visualize the defect. So you could certainly have a diffuse area of bone that looks fairly normal, but has significant bone loss within the structure of the bone. So again, many times the gross evaluation is much more severe than the, the radiographic evaluation once you open that up, as opposed to the, the gross evaluation that we talked about on that first slide where we're just looking at the tissue, which is very misleading. And unfortunately, when we see this in practice, it many times is the exception uh, or is the rule and not the exception in that we see a lot of mouths that look fairly normal, but we start taking full mouth radiographs and we find that they're very abnormal. This is a patient that we saw many years ago that has a defect back behind the first molar. And when you look at the radiographic anatomy that I'm about to show you here of this, this patient, you can see that there's a orientation between the first molar and the second molar that creates an ideal environment for plaque to accumulate. We've got these two surfaces that act as cups that hold that plaque and keep it in contact with the tissue between these two teeth. And consequently, many times when no other area in the oral cavity, especially in some of these big dogs, uh, large breeds that are not particularly predisposed to periodontal disease, many times this area will be affected whereas the rest of the mouth looks really nice. So this is a good place to look commonly. Another place that you'll find as well is right here, mesial to this first molar in the interdental space between the first premolar and the first molar, where we've got uh, a lot of crowding of the crown and many times asynchrony in the eruption 
uh, length of these two teeth, whereas the neck of this tooth may be a lot higher, leaving all of this root exposed to bone at birth. So that's an area that also has uh, tremendous potential for periodontal disease. But looking at this defect, what we've got has been created by this orientation. So if we want to try to save this tooth, the best approach is to extract one of the predisposing causes of that, and that's that relationship right there. So by extracting this tooth, we set ourselves up for a more predictable amount of success in trying to regrow bone back into this defect. And what our goal is when we're doing this type of regenerative therapy is to actually regrow uh, uh, periodontal ligament in the periodontal ligament space, grow cementum over the dentin, which is exposed here, and also grow bone in this defect. <clears throat> And um, we'll show you how to do that in just a second. So extracting this tooth, <clears throat> we now have access or better access to this area. But what we want to do is bring that flap a little more rostral like we have and you see here to expose that bone. Now, what we're looking at, uh, at here again is very similar to what we just saw where we've got this area of bone and it corresponds to this level of bone, as you see radiographically. Down inside of that defect, we also have this trough that carries it even further and makes it even diff more difficult to clean that out and get it to the point where we can actually try to regrow some tissue there. So that is our exposure. <clears throat> what we do from this point is to use hand curettes to take and clean these root surfaces off really nicely and then get those curettes down into this trough of this defect and try to get all of that granulation tissue out. Sometimes we have to use special burrs that are very uh, fine, made of diamonds to go down in and assist in our bone removal, being very careful, or in our uh, soft tissue removal, being very careful that we don't injure the, the uh, tooth root or the bone while doing so. So that exposure allows us to clean the area up. And then once we clean that area, we take a root conditioner, which can either be EDTA or citric acid, and place that on the root structure. Now what that does, it allows us to remove all of the inorganic components that are now present in the dentinal tubules. When we do root planing, we're actually scraping that root and we're creating little shavings of dentin and we're creating little shavings of diseased uh, uh, tissue that's down in there and actually forcing it into those little tubules. So by using EDTA, which is an inorganic solvent, we can dissolve all of that and rinse that off. And we apply that for four minutes, let it sit, and then rinse it out with, with saline. And then as you see here, this is a bone graft particulate called console that we use. It's a bioglass, uh, which is uh, approved for use in dental applications for dogs and cats, and it's been around for quite some time. There's another compound now that we use commonly as well called Synergy, and it is a Bio, biological grade tricalcium phosphate combined with hydroxyapatite, which is more uh, uh, consistent with the components of bone as opposed to the bioglass, the silicate glass that uh, console is constructed of. So we place that bone graft material in the defect and we can overfill that defect so that when that bone graft particulate starts to settle, it will remain at the marginal bone level and won't drop below that level. If, if the bone graft drops below the level of the bone, there's a good possibility the bone is just going to follow that bone graft and will end up losing a couple millimeters of uh, bone margin. So um, we like to try to overfill the defect a little bit if we can. So here, it, again, is the... The defect prior to our attempt, note also that we've got some early furcation uh, involvement here as well. 
and then that is the defect after we, we're done. <clears throat> you can see here we've got a very nice periodontal ligament space, which tells us that we have cementum and periodontal ligament there, and a nice, uh, nice bone fill here, and also that frication has filled in quite nicely as well. So uh, nice result. We were able to follow this patient out six or seven years. Uh, this was a patient in our general practice that we uh, saw every six months for a prophy and were uh, very fortunate to get these follow-up radiographs and be able to follow this for that period of time. I'm going to break away one second and see. Um, Anastasia, are, are you out there? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to assume that you just, uh, I, I just can't hear you and uh, that you guys are there and we're just going to keep going. Um, one thing that I, I want to mention to all the, the pre-vet students is that you guys are in a tremendous opportunity situation in that you have kind of been based on this seminar and maybe some other exposure that you've had pre-warned, I guess would be a good way to put it, uh, that dentistry is a tremendous opportunity for practitioners in the marketplace right now. There are not a tremendous number of general practitioners that are trained to do basic surgical dentistry procedures. And when we are looking at an individual that has had training in dentistry that can do uh, two things very well. One is surgical extractions. The other is full mouth dental radiography expediently. If those two things are, are met, then the general practitioner can find a very profitable and very rewarding position in, in most any veterinary practice that is a void of that individual at this point. Dentistry is definitely a very profitable segment of our practices. It's something that the practitioner is now going to, and the trend is, is trending and has been trending for quite some time and won't stop trending for quite some time, and that is for dentistry to become one of the major profit centers in the general practice today. But again, dental radiography and proficient and efficient full mouth radiography, as well as training in surgical extractions and basic periodontal therapy is what you should strive for on, on your resume just by training at, at seminars around the country. You're likely not going to get a lot of training in veterinary school, depending on where you go. And if you guys, all of you guys at FSU, many of you will be going to Auburn, Georgia, and Florida. And right now, there are not good, uh, well-established programs that are at the level that we feel that they should be at any one of those universities yet. I think they're moving in that direction, but at this point, it's it's just not happening quick enough. And so most of the folks that are actually getting training in dentistry right now or have in the past, those people have gotten those that training from seminars around the country. Uh, the Veterinary Dental Forum being one of those, which is held every October or November at a city somewhere around the country. Uh, I have a training seminar at my office in Punta Gorda, Florida, and we hold seminars there uh, that teach those techniques for canine dentistry and feline dentistry once or twice a year. Uh, they are not confined to veterinarians. If uh, you know, certainly students would also uh, have an opportunity to register for those. We don't take a lot of registrants. We only do uh, nine or ten per seminar, so everyone has their own high-speed delivery system, and uh, other folks are doing that as well. Tony Woodward out in Colorado, uh, Dr. Luskin 
up in Baltimore. So there are other facilities besides mine for that opportunity for you. So I'll mention that. So let's look at uh, some more cases. This um, this guy is a uh, fairly uh, fairly young dog uh, that has had unfortunately a fractured fourth premolar, and you can see the leading edge of this. And inside of this is debris and calculus. And we've also got some secondary periodontal disease because we don't have that normal bulge that we have on the marginal uh, crown of this fourth premolar that actually deflects the food away from the tissue when the pet chews. So every time this dog chews, it's jamming that food and debris up into this tissue and creating all this inflammation. And you can see it extends all the way up into, into this tissue as well. Now, looking at the x-ray of this, we can see how profound the changes are. You saw the bone loss adjacent to that root on that last case. In this situation, we have the back root or the distal root affected on this tooth more severely than the others. And you can see this big lucency. And what's happened is this tooth has become affected with periodontal disease and it has also killed the tooth itself. And now what we're looking at is the bone that's been destroyed around that tooth because the infection has gotten out of the apex here and started to eat the bone away. What happens a lot of times over month, many, many months, maybe years, is that classic case where you'll see a patient come in that has a fistula under one of the eyes. And this results in that fistula, but it may take a very long time for that to happen. This is one uh, case. This is not the, the radiograph that you saw previously, but this is how bad this can actually get. This dog had exactly the same tooth affected on the left side, and this is after we've cleaned the defect out, and all of that tissue that you see is down through the musculature on the side of the face, and into the suborbital tissue here. Oh, this, this guy had had that brewing for quite some time and was uh, very severely affected by that. <clears throat> a lot of these patients don't show any clinical signs either until they're um, actually presented with the suborbital fistula. So these go on undetected at home with the owner. <clears throat> this is a... Uh, patient that has obviously some pretty severe calculus buildup and tartar buildup. And you could literally reach in in some of these teeth and pull them out with your fingers. However, when we approach these cases, we don't just do extractions. And unfortunately, in practice, a lot of times the criteria for removing teeth in patients with periodontal disease is if they're mobile, they're removed. If they're not mobile and there's pathology maybe around them, they're cleaned as, as good as possibly can be cleaned without opening up the tissue with the ultrasonic scaler and the patient sent home. And that's, that's somewhat of a tragedy in that when we approach this case, we're not just extracting these teeth because the teeth are, are just kind of the innocent bystanders. All up in this tissue is all of that granulation tissue that we talked about. And it's all infected, nasty tissue. The bone is possibly very fimbriated on its edges. There's a level of osteomyelitis that's going on. And so extracting these teeth alone doesn't do a lot of good for the patient. So the way we approach this is we actually take and we take our scalpel, we make an incision all the way down through this area and all the way back. And then all of this tissue goes up to expose this so that we can see all the diseased tissue. And not only do we extract the teeth, but we take a, a generally a, a medium grit, uh, grit football burr on a high speed handpiece with a um, with a water coolant hitting that burr, and we go in and clean up all that granulation tissue and clean up all that bone, so that there is no more infection there. It's all 
uh, removed. And then once that's, that's done, we take radiographs to make sure, absolutely sure that we've got everything out of there. And once that's completed, then we close the gingiva back to the mucosa on the other side with sutures. And so consequently, when that patient leaves, <clears throat> the patient doesn't have any infection left. So in that respect, that brings up another question that we hear quite commonly. And that is, <clears throat> how about antibiotics for these guys? And <clears throat> the answer is a, a little bit controversial, but for the most part, when you look at the recommendations of the American Dental Association, the ADA used to recommend antibiotics for even patients that had uh, uh, pacemakers and other cardiac uh, changes that now they don't even recommend antibiotics for. Basically, the recommendations for antibiotics extend to the patient that has an implant in a joint. So an artificial hip or an artificial shoulder, artificial knee, those patients would get intraoperative ampicillin and possibly uh, a day or two of postoperative antibiotics, but generally not. <clears throat> we approach our patients somewhat similarly in that when we look at a case like this that you're looking at now and we treat it based on the description that I just gave, we eliminate all the infection. When they leave, there's no more infection left unless there's a little bit of a marginal gingivitis because of the, uh, the fact that we couldn't ex uh, excise all the tissue. So the patient gets intraoperative antibiotics when all of the bacterial shower happens in the bloodstream. But after we're done, uh, we very infrequently dispense antibiotics back to the patient. So this, uh, just to back up a second, that little guy came in for a spay. And we looked at that mouth and we said, no, 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 no. We're not going to spay this dog until we get the infection cleared up in his mouth. So we were fortunate enough to get these good post-op shots because this is about three weeks after the extractions and cleaning up that tissue and suturing it back. Uh, you can see on the mandible. Well, actually, I don't have a mandible a shot on this one, but you can see um, on the on the mandible, and I think we can possibly see right here and right here. There's still some little sutures uh, left, and there's a little suture there. So we're only about three or four weeks post-op, but you can see how nice that looks, and the patients feel so much better once all that's cleaned up. It's just amazing to see the the pet owner come back and have some positive behavioral change that they can uh, 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 talk about that this pet this pet has gone through. And usually it's not one behavioral change. It's probably three or four positive behavioral changes that they've gone through since they've had these extractions. They're not sleeping as much. They're eating more. Uh, their eyes are not watering. They, they play more. They just feel so much better. So uh, these are very rewarding cases. And when uh, back to uh, to all you guys that are out there in practice and uh, all of you who are in the uh, pre-vet club at FSU, once you guys become practitioners and you're out working and seeing patients, one of the most rewarding things that you can encounter is when that patient comes back and he feels a, a tremendous uh, a burden has been lifted from the standpoint of, of pain and also just systemic malaise because these guys undergo a lot of endotoxic shower and, and bacterial shower constantly with this uh, periodontal infection that they bear. And removing it and being able to see the patient look better on the two to four week recheck and hear the owner's comments on how well they've done is just one of the most rewarding things that you can encounter in practice. And for those of you who are not in practice yet, uh, you, you, you'll encounter it. And uh, those of you who are know what I'm talking about, but it's, it's just uh, phenomenal to see that. So we've talked, talked about dogs and periodontal disease, and that's kind of all we've talked about so far as periodontal disease. And one of the reasons uh, that we've talked about that is because that's what you guys see every day. That's what you're going to be treating in dentistry every day. 
eighty percent of my my practice is probably perio, uh, and and almost all of that, uh, maybe seventy percent of that, is surgical extractions to remove uh, uh, teeth that are encumbered by the bone and tissue that you've seen radiographically and grossly in these past couple of cases. So your practice in general practice, if you learn surgical extractions and you learn full mouth radiography will be almost identical to what we do on a specialty level in, in, uh, in general practice. So cats are not immune to perio either. Um, as a matter of fact, cats have two main problems that we see almost exclusively in them, and that is periodontal disease and tooth resorption. If you take a look at this, this particular patient, we've got this huge, almost mass-like or tumor-like bulge adjacent to the fourth or to the uh, uh, 204 here, which is the left maxillary canine tooth in this cat. And if you notice the neck of the tooth here is all the way down coronal to the marginal gingiva. That's not because the gums receded, it's because this tooth is being extruded and the body's trying to push this tooth out because of all this all this uh, bone expansion, periodontal disease and infection that's going on up inside here. That's what it actually looks like. That's the same patient with the tissue exposed. And you can see here where I've just taken my finger and put a little pressure on the edge of this bone and to press that tissue down into the defect. It's just that lytic and that soft. So what we do is we open up a flap uh, to expose that area and we remove all this bone, all of this nasty granulation tissue in order to um, have, have access to a nice clean tissue and then we close that. Um, that's what it looks like when it's closed. We do a lot of extractions in kitties. Uh, one other thing that we see in cats is tooth resorption. And this is a, uh, a radiographic, or this is a gross example. And we'll show you the radiographic interpretation in a second, where we have a lesion that is very friable here, adjacent to this tooth. And we've got a defect here in the tooth itself where the gum has grown into it. And just touching that with a probe causes it to bleed significantly. And those are painful for cats once they get into, into this, um, uh, this extent. Now, take a look at these two teeth. We're going to show you the x-rays on both. And you can see there's a line here of erythema that's associated with this one and a half, two millimeter region of gingiva. And looking at it radiographically, you can see why, because the bone is dropped down, exposing that tissue, and all that is is a big pocket with periodontal infection down into that tissue. So radiographically, you can compare these two, and looking at this, this is a periodontal lesion. We've got a nice tooth structure, but the tooth next to it, the one that's got the tooth resorption, you can see the area on the crown radiographically that's been destroyed that represents that area of gingiva or, or gum tissue that's migrated into that defect and is painful for the patient. And we, we generally have um, these coincide a lot of times. And you can see this tooth also affected by periodontal disease in that the bone level is down here uh, exposing its furcation as well. Normally the bone level would be up around the neck of the tooth uh, right in this region and you would see a nice fill contiguous with this density up in the furcation as well. But in this cat, um, you've got this, this uh, area of bone loss affecting both of these teeth. So extractions uh, would be the way to go on these. On some of these where we don't actually see a root structure like we see here, bone is actually replacing this root. So many times because it is bone, we can't extract. We actually have to amputate the crown, remove any diseased root that's still left till we get down to bone, and then uh, suture back over the top of that. This is another uh, example where all of the root structure on both of 
these roots on this third premolar on the left mandible on this cat have been affected. You can't even make out a root, root structure. It's all uh, bone replacing that. So when we see that, <clears throat> what we generally do is make a little flap around the tooth. And this is, uh, we made an incision here. We made an incision here. And then we've taken our periosteal elevator, which is a little instrument that allows us to remove the gum tissue from the bone, exposing that bone and making it such that we can uh, visualize it and use a burr to get down in there and smooth all that out. Then once we've done that, we just close the um, gingiva. Uh, here's the, the picture of the bone smoothed down uh, so that it's level with the, with the other marginal bone. And then we put a little suture to uh, in to close. And um, that's the approach to that type two uh, tooth resorption lesion. This is a, another case of a suborbital fistula. You can also see there's considerable ocular involvement here uh, because this is so close to the periocular tissue, <clears throat> the suborbital fat, and all of the vasculature. A lot of times we can get inflammation of the eye uh, where the infection and inflammation get into the eye and cause changes like this. So it can be uh, pretty profound. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is actually a picture of a patient that has had um, the, or actually the patient that you just saw that has had really no visible changes on this tooth at all. There's not anything that, that uh, looks, looks bad. There's no fractures. There's no uh, real degree of periodontal disease here at all. But we look at it radiographically and there's that lesion again. So a tooth doesn't have to be fractured like we saw previously in order to produce a, a non-vital tooth. Uh, this dog may have chewed some type of hard substance over time and caused that pulp to be inflamed without fracturing the tooth. Now, some of you may be looking at this radiograph and, and say, well, there's a fracture there. Actually, what that is, is a developmental groove here. This is not a fracture, and that, that certainly can be misinterpreted as a fracture, but that's the, that's the developmental groove in that crown. Another situation where we actually do have a fracture, but it hasn't affected the pulp. It's, it affects a large surface of dentin, and consequently, in this scenario, if the dentin becomes exposed, the dentin is not as strong as the, as the actual uh, enamel itself. So bacteria can get into dentin through little tubules that are present there that are microscopic that you can't see. It can invade the pulp, kill the pulp, and eventually shows up as the lucencies that we've been seeing on radiographs. And this is that exact tooth. And again, you see that, that big area where the bone has been destroyed around that tooth root. <clears throat> this is a, a dog that has a lesion that's not quite under the orbit like our classic lesions are. It's a little too far rostral to expect it to be that same thing, but this dog has had this thing for quite some time. <clears throat> it goes away with antibiotics, but it comes back shortly thereafter. And if you take a look in the mouth, lo and behold, there's a, a tooth that's not only fractured, but it's also uh, a cream uh, discoloration there of that crown. And both of those are good indicators that that tooth is non-viable. You look a little closer and you see this little defect here. This is a fit, uh, an area where the infection's gotten out of the tooth root and has affected the bone to the point where it's broken through the tissue and produced a lesion much like the one on top of the nose on this guy, uh, where the, the uh, bone has been destroyed and now the, now the infection's trying to get out into the tissue. If you see a lesion like this, and it's above this line that separates the gum that's attached to the tooth and the gum that's not attached to the tooth and the alveolar mucosa, almost always that indicates that the tooth is dead and it's an endodontic lesion as opposed to a lesion like this that's in this tissue below the line. Almost always that's a periodontal lesion due to periodontal disease. So here's a picture of that tooth. This is the defect here. You can see how 
it extends uh, fairly fairly uh, readily around in this uh, nice little round defect here. Note the diameter of the pulp cavity of this tooth. And then take a look at the tooth on the other side. And when a tooth matures normally, it produces dentin continually throughout life. So in a young dog, this tooth would have a huge pulp cavity like you see here. And as the dog ages, dentin is produced at this interface between the pulp and the dentin from the odontoblasts that eventually cause this dentin to be thicker and thicker and thicker as the animal ages. If the tooth dies, like we have here, the dentin also stops being produced. So you have a much larger pulp cavity in this tooth because it died months to years prior than you do in this tooth, which went on to mature normally. This, this poor guy came in kind of as a last chance. He'd had a tooth extracted a while back and unfortunately this defect kept returning and it would go away with antibiotics but it would come back much like the one that you just saw and these folks were at their wits end and they were ready for euthanasia and fortunately we were able to see this guy and the extraction attempt previously was not successful because when we took a radiograph we saw this root that was left from the previous extraction and you can see how the bone has been destroyed around that root tip. So there is where the source of the infection was. We went in, we opened the tissue up, we found that root, we cleaned all this up, suits, uh, sutured it back, and this guy uh, went on to do absolutely phenomenal. There's the po post-op uh, view, uh, making sure that we got all the root. And this is um, a patient that had a similar presentation with a swelling here, it's kind of hard to see uh, on this guy. It was very subtle when we saw him. He had been on antibiotics for, for um, a week or so. And you can kind of see a little bit of a swelling here as well. But we took radiographs, which we always do on that side. Um, we saw a fractured tooth. So there was you know, probably a pretty good indication that that's what was going on. But if we just went based on that fractured tooth and didn't take x-rays, uh, we'd be getting into some trouble. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you why in a second. Again, this can be enough exposure, as you saw previously, to cause this tooth to die and for us to have um, that swelling on the side of the face. But in this case, we look at the x-ray and this bone is not what we would expect with normal bone. We see that lucency here, but at the same time, we see some very severe destruction, very unusual, very lucent bone, uh, not normal bone by any means. This is severe destruction. And this is the other side to comparison. This is nice uh, bone with good trabeculation here. This is all normal. And again, compared to what we're seeing here. So uh, when we see that kind of, of bone change, the first thing we think of is cancer. Uh, we could possibly get osteomyelitis that look like that, but it's very uncommon. Uh, and this guy actually had fibrosarcoma. Uh, the treatment on that, on that uh, patient actually was... Uh, was uh, euthanasia. It was just too far advanced and uh, the, the, um, there was no surgical uh, cure for that patient. <clears throat> this this uh, is a standard poodle we saw uh, uh, several years ago in Orlando. And this guy presented with this tumor, which we diagnosed as an acanthomatous amyloblastoma, which is a, a big, nasty uh, tumor that invades locally, but it doesn't has a, have a chance uh, generally to go elsewhere. There's never been a reported case of metastasis for these. However, in order to take care of this lesion and have it not come back, we've got to go a centimeter into normal tissue. So that takes us into the other side of the jaw, 
And consequently, in order to get this tumor and remove all of it, we need to come all the way back here to the first molar and then go to the third premolar on the other side in order to get this. So that's, that's what the owners wanted and that's what we did. Um, there's an x-ray of the, pic, the, uh, the mass itself. This is an intraoperative shot. You can see the patient's on his back. Here's the palate, the canine teeth, the tongue here. <clears throat> and here is the area of excision. We took some of the sublingual lingual musculature as well. And here are the two halves of the mandible uh, prior to closure. Here's the patient after closure. You can see the gap, the tremendous gap here. And one thing that I really want to stress on these cases is we are very successful with controlling and managing the pain in these, these patients. And we do so in part, as many of you know, that have seen me speak previously, that nerve blocks are a vital component to every surgery that we do. And so when this patient wakes up, he won't feel a, a thing if the nerve blocks are done correctly. And we have a very, very strong success rate with these nerve blocks in that we keep the patients very light. So we know if we make an incision and they start to wake up that the nerve blocks have not been successful. The nerve blocks are on board and they're working well. Then consequently, we, we know that uh, we're not going to expect them to react when we make that incision. So <clears throat> this is uh, the afternoon of the day of surgery. Uh, this was this was a mid-afternoon, uh, somewhere around 2 p.m. when we finished this guy up. <clears throat> this is the next day in the parking lot, ready to go home. And you can see <clears throat> that um, this guy doesn't even know anything hit him. He's perfectly comfortable uh, attentive, uh, very uh, reactive, and the owners were just ecstatic that we could discharge this guy the next day after such a radical surgery. He did very, very well. Uh, initially, he had to learn to turn his head uh, to eat uh, the gruel off the floor, and then uh, eventually got to the point where he could get it out of the bowl by turning his head. So uh, great success story. This guy came back every year to visit at Christmas and uh, did very, very well. No recurrence uh, at all. Dropped back about two hours today. This is a patient that we saw uh, earlier, the uh, second to last patient that we did today in Orlando. This is another uh, standard poodle, six months old, that came in that had a malocclusion where the breeder had clipped the deciduous canine teeth because they were present when the adult teeth were coming in. And consequently, uh, this, this guy abscessed. And not only did that happen, but also the baby canine teeth prevented the adult teeth from moving outward into their normal location, which would be not hitting into the gum here, but sitting and resting nice and comfortably here. <clears throat> Same thing on the other side. You can see where this is hitting right at the uh, area right between these two teeth, uh, almost, almost as bad as this side. This side was a little bit worse. If you take a look at the defects that were produced, this is the left side where the canine tooth had dug into the palatal mucosa. <clears throat> Same thing on, on the other side. You can see the defects here. And this, this poor guy, when um, we induced him, he was still a little bit light. And when I closed the mouth to check the bite, he actually chattered, his jaw chattered. So every time he closed his mouth, um, it was painful for him. Uh, during waking, for sure, if it was painful for him uh, during the evaluation under under uh, propofol and, and his pre-meds. So what we did and what we can do is a lot of different things in this circumstance. But what we did in this guy was we did what we call an auto incline, where we take a little burr um, and we make a incline area out of the gum tissue 
Uh, this is very thick gum tissue and we can go down in here without actually getting into the bone with a little uh, 12 fluted burr or a diamond burr and create a little groove for this tooth to uh, come into. <clears throat> it's kind of difficult to see on this side. Let's see if we can see it on the, yeah, we can see it on the other side better. <clears throat> but what we've done, this is the arch of the normal tooth you can see right here. What we've done is we've created a little composite extension here so that it will engage this defect that we've created and help to move both of these teeth outward as this tooth continues to erupt. This dog's only six months of age, so the eruption potential for this is um, another three to four months. So that tooth will continue to erupt, will probably actually be where we want to be in four to six weeks. Uh, we'll check him back in 30 days and probably uh, in two months, we'll get him back, sedate him again. We'll have these teeth back into the normal relationship. All of this gum tissue will heal. It'll look nice and pink just like this. The groove will stay there to, to a very small extent and these teeth will move outward uh, toward, toward the uh, normal location. So for, for those of you at, at Florida State, these are just some of the procedures that we do on a specialty level that you've seen just recently. Uh, we do a lot of cancer therapy. We do uh, some trauma with mandibular fractures. We use uh, very, uh, well, I actually, I must say that I've, I've never actually used uh, a, a plate or a screw and a mandible in my life. We've always been able to repair mandibular fractures with uh, interdental wiring with the teeth or using acrylic between the teeth or creating inclined planes, uh, or I'm sorry, creating uh, acrylic uh, planes that span the tooth in a U-shape for some fractures, but uh, very non-invasive, very um, comfortable for the patient and uh, not as invasive as the traditional plates and screws and some of the other devices that you might have seen used for fracture repair. So dentists do quite a quite a bit of uh, a perio work, periodontal surgery, surgical extractions. Uh, we also do some orthodontics, as you see here in this case. Uh, we do a lot of cancer, uh, uh, jaw removal, pain management for oral cancer. And uh, we also do a lot of root canals on dogs that have fractured teeth. Uh, we've got a sheriff's, uh, uh, one of the sheriff's department's dogs coming in tomorrow, actually, here in Orlando with a fractured canine tooth that we'll be doing a root canal and a crown preparation on. So um, probably got time for one more case. Um, this is a little dog that we saw in Orlando um, back uh Several years ago, probably five years ago now, this is Paco. Paco is one of the nicest little chihuahuas you'll ever want to meet. And as you can see, he's got a pretty nice little uh, little smile there. He's got a little little uh, class three malocclusion where the mandible is a little bit longer than his upper jaw. And consequently, those incisors protrude. Now, that's not what he came in for. He came in because those incisors were loose. And... The, the recommendation that I had to the owner <clears throat> was to extract those teeth. And if uh, you had been in the exam room, you might have thought that she was coming after me because she was so angry that I had made that suggestion that Paco lose those teeth that he's had for 10 years. And she's, uh, she's uh, awakened and gone to bed with every day of her life and seen him like that ever since he was a puppy. So uh, she was not interested whatsoever in departing with those teeth. And so her, um, her, I guess, stern comment to me was, you're going to save them. So we, uh, we do have a procedure that we can do uh, that we can save teeth like that. And uh, we, did, we published a, a, an article about, oh, I'd say eight or 10 years ago in the Journal of Veterinary Dentistry. And these images are from the cadaver that we did to publish that article. Uh, so these are not actually Paco, <clears throat> but this is the, the uh, same type of procedure. And what we do is take and we remove the attachment to the bone and the tooth here 
by creating a flap to expose all that area and then um, doing that also on the lingual side, cleaning out all of the area between these teeth roots. And in Paco, this, this bone level was much, much less. And in these patients, we see that there's very little bone when we get to the point where we're doing this procedure all the way down in this level. <clears throat> and consequently, we clean all that out, make sure that it's nice and smooth. Uh, and then we suture the gingiva or the gum level back to the new bone level. And so we expose all these roots so that they can be cleaned uh, by the owner. And we have to get these patients back every three to six months so that we can also clean in the hospital to keep them maintained. In uh, Paco, this is Paco's radiograph. You can see here the bone level was almost non-existent over this tooth root. Here's the end of the tooth and here's the bone level on this root. Uh, same thing on this side on the second incisor. So the bone was severely compromised on all these. They were all loose. And so we also put a splint behind that with a composite, which is the same material that we use to do those extensions on that case that we just saw. So there's Paco with his um, uh, new procedure. And you can see the um, little splint back there that's made these all these teeth um, much more of a unit than they are uh, as a uh, six little uh, fence posts blowing in the wind. So it makes it much more stable. And there's looking at it from the backside. So uh, the owner would brush this every day and she did a pretty good job. Uh, Paco would come back every three months to have his teeth clean. We saw Paco for probably about two years uh, for that uh, procedure every three months. And um, lo and behold, uh, one day the owner called and um, said that Paco had tried to jump off of the couch and had fractured his uh, little device that we put on uh, to, to stabilize those teeth. So we, we got Paco back in and unfortunately for Paco, those teeth had a bulge. And so I, I, I talked to the owner and said, uh, Julie, we cannot save these uh, teeth. They are going to have to come out. There's absolutely no bone left. They've, they've uh, been luxated from the bone. And so her response was, well, you're going to make him a bridge. So that's exactly what we did. So we saved the teeth. As you see here, uh, extracted them all, uh, got Paco back in two months after everything had healed. and used a uh, little piece of styrofoam to try to recreate the curvature of the teeth and then took and made a little groove here in the back for a little special compound called Ribon, which we used again, that same composite to bind to these teeth. And we had a little uh, leading edge on both of these that we um, bonded with that same composite to the canine teeth. And so we were able to create a little bridge here, and then we just cut off the tooth roots at the level of the gum to create that little uh, little device. So there's Paco with his new grill, uh, looking quite handsome, and um, he did uh, he did quite well um, until uh, one day when the owner again called and said Paco has gotten in a fight with his buddy. And now his bridge is gone. It's, it's, it's out. And I'm going to bring it back in the next time you're in Orlando so that you can put it back. And my response was, Julie, are you sure that you want to put him through that again? And she said, absolutely. We'll be in next time you're here. So the next uh, visit to Orlando, Paco was a no-show. And we called to find out what was wrong. and. Uh, the, uh, Julie said, well, you know, I, I'm so sorry, Dr. Beckman, I forgot to call. I, I meant to call and cancel Paco's appointment, but I like him better with no front teeth. So after all of that, after, after actually almost three and a half years of every three months to save those teeth, she decided that he looked better without his teeth. So that... Um, 
that concludes our cases today. Um, I never did get acknowledgement that FSU is on the line. Are you guys there? Um, I'm going to come back and and see if uh, Anastasia is there. Uh, are you guys there by any chance? Can you hear me? Well, evidently not. Um, those of you who are in the uh, the audience, um, if you would like, uh, we've got about another oh, 12 minutes or so, 15 minutes maybe, before we're going to end this session. Uh, if you want to just ask me any questions, you've got the, the chat function there that you can uh, utilize to ask me any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions at all? We've still got about uh, 38 folks out there with us, and um, we'll just give you a few seconds and see. I see uh, Erica McKee. Uh, what suture uh, do we use in the mouth? Generally, what we use is monochrome. And uh, we like monocryl because it's a monofilament and it really glides nicely through the tissue. We use a cutting needle uh, when, we're, when we're doing uh, uh, medium dogs and large dogs. We're going to be using a 4 uh suture with an FS2 or FS3 cutting needle on it. When we do cats uh, or small dogs, uh, we generally use a 5 aught with a P3 needle, and that looks very uh, works very well as uh, uh, very good as well. Uh, good question. Do we recommend full mouth x-rays for every patient every time, even for one-year rechecks? Um, the answer to that is uh, no. In, in essence, we don't recommend full mouth x-rays every time. Uh, it's very patient dependent. If we have a patient that has generalized periodontal disease that we've done a lot of perio work on, uh, maybe we've, we've done uh, quite a few root planing and curatage, uh, areas. Maybe we've done some guided tissue regeneration like we did in that first case that we showed you today. Um, then we may be taking full mouth every time we come in for rechecks, but it's very unlikely. Generally, what we'll do is we'll take full mouth every 18 months to two years in those periodontal patients. And then if they're coming in every three months, which some of them do, uh, or every six months, Brittany, uh, what we'll do is probe, look for abnormal areas, and take rechecks, uh, x-rays of, of those at, uh, areas. Thanks, uh, Brittany uh, Hamring, for that. Ah, good question. Uh, Desiree Thomas, uh, with the first tooth that we showed uh, that looked healthy outside, but the pocket was, uh, was present radiographically, what would happen if it wasn't extracted? That, that uh, progression would be fairly significant over time. Um, I, I can't recall exactly how old that dog was, but I, I don't think it was more than five, six, seven years of age. And um, consequently, that defect is deep and it's going to progress fairly rapidly. You, you, might, uh, you might get that tooth being totally mobile uh, within months to a year or more. Uh, more importantly, if it's not extracted for the patient, from the patient's standpoint, um, it, it hurts. Uh, it's uncomfortable. If anybody's had just minor periodontal lesions uh, between teeth, maybe adjacent to cavities, you know it's uncomfortable. Uh, just think about what that bone 
loss and those lesions look like in in those patients from a pain standpoint. So they're uh, they're uncomfortable. We can take a a uh, just probe those very softly and uh, get to the point where they're um, they're definitely a uh, an issue for the, the patient even under anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> Ashley Hopkins, uh, what would you recommend to a veterinary student seeking to get more hands-on experience before graduation? You spoke of some seminars and training earlier. Uh, do you offer externships or internships at your practice? Um, I, I think your best bet, Ashley, in something uh, along those lines would be to actually go to a seminar where uh, we're, we're, we're teaching the procedures that you'll be using mostly. Um, externships, internships, eh, you get to see things, uh, but you don't actually get the hands-on, and that's what you need. You need to be able to have proper instruction for the actual procedures that you're going to be doing, and that's where the valuable learning comes in. We recommend to uh, many of our seminar attendees when we do these wet labs and lectures um, that they get a cadaver head. Uh, they buy a cadaver head from Skulls Unlimited. They go um, home and, and practice the procedures that they've learned in the seminar just so that they can get more proficient and get better. So that's what I would recommend. Um, you see my, my website up right there, uh, the, the uh, veterinarydentistry.net. I have all of our uh, seminars listed as a link from the home page on that veterinarydentistry.net so you can find out uh, some further information from that. And uh, Elizabeth has the same question there, Elizabeth Rivers. Um, <laughs> Patrick, uh, evidently you're you're a little bit more uh, advanced than than most of the audience. I guess to um, <clears throat> to to answer that question, uh, you, you would actually have to see the closure. Uh, it, it depends on the individual case. In other words, we take our margins and then we figure out how to close the defect afterwards. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it, it can be a bit of a, of a, a crapshoot on how we close those. We, we're, it, it's always putting a piece of the puzzle together when we close them. So to answer your question briefly, uh, it depends on the case, but uh, good question. Um, uh, yes, uh, Dorothy, I will have uh, have this recorded, and this will be on YouTube. I don't know um, uh, when I'll have time to get it on. I've got to convert the video. It's probably not going to be this week, probably not going to be next week. I'm very busy uh, in Orlando and Atlanta uh, next week, but uh, it'll be up there soon. You can... Um, if you guys uh, want to, why don't you do this, uh, everybody that's listening? If you're if you're not um, uh, where you know the links for my blog and for my YouTube channel, uh, why don't you? Or um, well, actually, all of you are on my email list, uh, so you you should you should have all those contacts. But um, my YouTube channel, you can find the YouTube channel. Just put Beckman and Veterinary Dentistry YouTube or something to that effect, and you'll, you'll, uh, it'll take you right to it. I think it's, I think it's YouTube uh, Veterinary Dentistry. And then um, on, on my blog that has a lot of cases on it as well, if you guys want to look at that, if you're not familiar with that, uh, veterinarydentistry.net slash blog, B-L-O-G. Uh, and that will take you to a lot of cases like we've just talked about, uh, only there's about 100 cases on there. So you can uh, look at your leisure on those. Stacy, that's, uh, that's a bit of a, of a uh, question that requires about an hour lecture or more. Um, but if you go on that blog, you'll, you'll be able to find, um, just look at tooth resorption. You should be able to find something on that. And that'll answer your question a little better than I can do it in a short period of time here. Um, when, do, uh, Lori, uh, when, when we're doing full mouth extractions, we generally, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at a dog uh, that has absolutely no periodontal uh, disease, 
that might be a stomatitis dog where we're taking all the teeth, but there's no uh, mobility, then you're looking at uh, two and a half to maybe four hours, depending on how uh, big the dog is, the access that we, we can get in the back part of the mouth, how ankylose those roots are. Uh, so it takes a long time. We generally do all of our appointments in the morning and then do all our procedures in the afternoon. I would recommend that type of approach if you're doing a lot of long procedures in dentistry. Um, <clears throat> Thomas Loff, uh, the, the EDTA stays on the root surface for four minutes and then it's rinsed off with saline. And that's a, um, enough time for that to uh, remove all of the inorganic components from the dental tubules. Um, Teresa, we use uh, either, uh, the question is from Teresa Tran, do we use a uh, lidocaine or uh, bicarb for our nerve blocks? We, we don't use bicarb. Bicarb uh, doesn't have that much of an effect uh, when we're looking at bupivacaine. So that it's kind of used or was used in human medicine for a while just to eliminate the sting. Uh, it does affect the duration and intensity of the block. So we generally don't use that. Uh, we use lidocaine and bupivacaine uh, together in the same syringe. And if you go to uh, that veterinarydentistry.net slash blog, one of the title, uh, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the word, the menu uh, titles has uh, uh, resources at the top. And those resources are articles that I've written, uh, some of the articles I've written in the past. One of those is specifically on nerve blocks, so there's a lot of detail uh, on that. Um, will we be having more webinar webinars? We're, we're actually in the process of doing some race-approved continuing education. Uh, that we will have, uh, there will be a minor charge for those. You will get race continuing education credits for those. They'll be approved for veterinarians and for technicians. Uh, you don't have to be uh, a certified technician uh, to attend. You don't have to be uh, uh, certified at all uh, for those, but uh, obviously your accreditation, uh, if you're certified, that's an extra uh, a bonus for you there. Uh, we do not use epinephrine with lidocaine and bupivacaine. Again, the effect, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, with lidocaine and bupivacaine, the effect of epinephrine on bupivacaine is minor, uh, so we don't uh, we don't tradi traditionally use that. Um, the final question, uh, just uh, uh, a good one from Teresa again. How do we handle stomatitis cats? The uh, the answer to that is pain management initially. Uh, we take these cats and we put them on a continuous rate infusion of uh, ketamine and an opiate at least two hours, if not 24 hours prior to actually going in and doing the surgery because these cats are so painful. <clears throat> and then um, once we've done that, uh, these guys just kind of relax and they feel so much better. We've, we've taken care of the NMDA receptor in the nucleus called Alice in the brainstem. Uh, another uh, term that relates to that area is, is wind-up pain. So the ketamine blocks the NMDA receptor so glutamate can't act on it and provides that mechanism of pain relief as well as the opiate receptor coverage that we get from the opiate as well. And um, we also handle the peripheral inflammatory pain with a, um, an NSAID if we can. And we're using Onsior now, which has been approved for use in cats, not for oral, but for uh, 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 surgical pain uh, in other, uh, other areas of the body. But it's been very effective for us, and we really like that. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the crown amputations have no place in stomatitis cats. Every tooth, even though it's, it may be um, ankylosed or it may be undergoing resorption, has to be removed. If we have a tooth that looks like that one that you saw <clears throat> that was the third premolar on the left mandible on that one slide of that cat, the second 
tooth resorption where we showed the actual procedure where we did the crown amputation, even those have to be removed. So we actually do a boat, uh, a dugout canoe type approach on the mandible to get those out of there. We'll actually go in and, and uh, remove the bone all the way down to the end of the alveolus where the root tip sits and make sure that we get every remnant of that tooth because uh, any roots left will result in uh, those cats not responding. And consequently, um, uh, they, they will be back and they will still have inflammation. So we make sure that we remove every single tooth. Um, some, sometimes if the rostral teeth, the, the canines and incisors are, are perfectly normal, we will just do extractions caudal to those, and uh, many of those cats will resolve. So we don't always do full mouth extractions, but we do very commonly because a lot of times those teeth are also affected either by inflammation uh, associated with periodontal disease or tooth resorption. And if they are, uh, we're gonna we're just gonna go ahead and remove all of them. <clears throat> then postoperatively for these cats. We keep them on that continuous rate infusion for um, uh, uh, hours, if not a day afterwards, depending on what facility I'm at, if I have overnight uh, vigil. And then we gradually, on the uh, that day or the next day, we will wean them off of the pain drip. Uh, we'll have a fentanyl patch that we've already placed that's on board, and we'll send them home on uh, gabapentin at two milligrams, or I'm sorry, five milligrams per kilogram twice a day. And then um, uh, we'll carry on with the Onseor, which we have uh, uh, orally for three days. So uh, these guys do quite well. Uh, we never put feeding tubes. I've never put a feeding tube in a cat. Uh, they, they uh, with the pain management, the way we do it, they, they just don't need it. They do very, very well. So we're out of time, guys, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, hope that our Florida State folks are there with us, and we just uh, uh, don't have audio from, from Anastasia. But Anastasia and, and Brittany, thank you guys if you're there. Uh, send me an email to let me know that you heard this, hopefully. And uh, thanks for all of you. Uh, glad to see you, John, in the, in the audience. John Rosado's in a lot of our our uh, seminars. Good to see you there. And um, we appreciate all you guys. If you would um, send me an email uh, to veterinary dentistry at gmail.com and let me know what you think about this, uh, how you change it, if anything, how your experience was as a listener and um, what you'd like to see as far as topics go, uh, maybe in the future for some of those accredited race seminars. Again, thank you all again. We appreciate you being here and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.